<laughs> okay, so my, my name is Steve Heinel, and I'd like to present a hobby project of mine. This is an open source software defined amateur radio called the Hermes Light. So this is uh, for ham radio operators, it's a receiver and a transmitter. So uh, the most novel part of this radio is that we've repurposed a cable modem IC. So um, anyone who has a cable modem at home, there's probably uh, something like this in there. And it turns out that this makes a decent SDR. There's a 12-bit 80 megahertz A to D and D to A converter in there, and also integrated low noise amplifier. And so because this is a commodity part and because of the integration, it can significantly reduce the cost. So this is one of the goals of the project. Uh, this entire radio costs about just under $300 to, uh, to purchase. Uh, this is what we call a direct down and up conversion radio. So it covers baseband frequencies only. So from the Nyquist Shannon theory, we, we can cover about 0.1 to 38 megahertz. This is the uh, soft, um, the short wave uh, frequencies. Um, it's different from other SDRs that you might know about, like the RTL SDR or the Lime SDR, which will cover uh, a larger set of frequencies in that we don't have an analog mixer. That's where the direct down and up conversion go. We, we feed the signal directly into the A to D converter. Uh, other SDRs will have an analog mixer that allows them to extend the frequency range, but this also adds some distortion and artifacts and noise. So since we're only interested in short wave frequencies, we do this direct conversion. This is also a complete radio transceiver. So um, that means that we have uh, some of the filtering that's required. We have uh, some instrument quality RF preamp because uh, we have a low power output and a full power output. We can use this as a vector uh, network analyzer also. And we also have a five watt RF power amplifier. So this is more than the hundreds of milliwatts you would typically see from an SDR. And it's enough to be a QRP transceiver, which means a low power amateur radio transceiver. To go along with that uh, five watt uh, amplifier, we also have this switched RF filter board. And uh, this is so that we meet the international regulations for harmonic suppression. So the amplifier will produce some harmonics and we need to attenuate that uh, with this board. We have one gigabit per second ethernet. And uh, this is so that the radio can be far away from the host computer. And finally, um, we use a Cyclone 4 25K logic element uh, FPJ for most of the digital signal processing. So I'd like to just explain a little bit about how we use this radio. Now that you can send instant messages around the world over the internet, uh, what's, what's the point? Well, it's kind of a, a sport. Uh, we monitor space weather. Uh, you know, we're at the low of an 11-year uh, solar cycle right now. And then we choose the times and the frequencies frequencies we want to operate on so that we can, you know, bounce our radio signals off the ionosphere and communicate long distances. Uh, here is a picture of one of the software packages we use with this radio. And um, we get a, a wide band uh, view of an entire amateur radio uh, band. This is the 40, 40, mega, 40 meters band. And you can, we can identify things that we couldn't before, like we can see household noise over here on the left. Here you see um, about 30 Morse code operators uh, going there. And then there's a digital FT8, which is a new popular digital mode, the one that I like to use. Uh, then we have single sideband voice communications, which is a technology since the 60s. And then on the very right, you can actually see a shortwave broadcaster. So unlike some other SDRs, um, everything on, on the shortwave uh, spectrum is very narrow band. We only have it from about three to 30 megahertz. So we're not interested in like large chunks of bandwidth, but we are interested in many receivers that are listening to um, small chunks of bandwidth. So here we have a piece of software that is running eight uh, receivers. And each of these receivers are listening to a different band in the short, amateur radio band in the shortwave spectrum. And in particular, this one is, is uh, monitoring FT8, which is a, a digital mode created by um, uh, a, a Nobel laureate from Princeton. Uh, he was doing radio astronomy, and uh, he's also an amateur radio operator, and so he used a lot of these techniques that he used for uh, you know, filtering out noise to develop this communication mode. So it's a very low bit rate, 
348 bits per second, but it's very uh, tuned uh, for noisy environments. And with that low bit rate, we can only send very short messages like our call sign, our location, and what, you know, how, what your signal strength is. And all of these reports are um, captured on the internet. And so there's this site, PSK, PSK Reporter, and here's a map view of uh, all the stations that I heard in the last 24 hours, and I just have a long wire antenna in my attic. Um, and uh, so we, all, all continents except Africa and uh, Antarctica, Africa's not too active. Uh, but uh, I also on transmitting, people in uh, New Zealand and Japan and other parts of North America have heard me. Um, here's another visualization. We can visualize the whole entire HF spectrum. So this is from 0 to 38 megahertz. And you could see over on the left where the AM broadcasters are. And you can actually see some interesting things like uh, my antenna has a better impedance match at certain frequencies. So you see these humps as you go up through the uh, radio spectrum. So it provides a very new kind of view to an, a, a long-time hobby. So this is entirely open source, or as, as much as open source as we can make it. We, we still use uh, the Cordis tools. Um, the FPGA, Verilog, uh, is, is in Verilog, and it was forked from a, another project, the Open HPSDR project. This is one of the earliest open hardware projects there was, and they, they uh, were one of the first to create a, an open hardware license, which is similar to GPL. There is no soft CPU in here, so we're doing everything by uh, state machines. And some of the IP that might be interesting for people to reuse, it's not packaged nicely, but if you dig into it, you could dig them out. Um, there is a small standalone UDP stack, which includes DHCP. So when I, when I plug this in, you know, it, it just gets an address uh, from my, my DHCP server, and uh, I could send uh, UDP, UDP streams to and from this. And so that, that fits in less than 3,000 logic elements. It it's, uh, could be something if, you're, if you have tight space in your FPJ and you want Ethernet connectivity. We also have some high-performance NCOs, uh, filters, and DSP on here that, that are written in Verilog. We're not relying on the vendor's um, IP for that. Um, it was done with KiCad. Um, so we have the schematics and PCB. We have, it's a four-layer board. We want it to reduce costs. And all files, including the BOM and, and Gerber, are on GitHub. One of our focuses is, is we, want to, we want to use a small batch assembly. So we want to be able to say, OK, 25 interested people can come together, and they can create an order from a, a small batch assembly house in China. So we've been working with two of them. And we've had about over 75 units made by uh, one. Uh, Homebrew people made about another 20, 30, and just this month uh, we, we finished a, a collaboration with Maker Fabs, which specializes in open hardware, and they sold 100 units. And so they're taking care of everything, the testing for us, um, manufacturer uh, fulfillment, which makes it very easy for a hobbyist to be able to get something like this out the door. Uh, we also do some co-simulation with MyHDL and Icarus Verilog. And so I wanted just to show you one of, one of, one of what we can do with that. Um, because it's Python, we have access to NumPy and SciPy. So that makes it very easy for us to look at things in the frequency domain, for instance. And so here we're looking at the output of our numerical controlled oscillator. And we want to make sure that you know, for all the frequencies, we don't have spurs that exceed a certain threshold. Um, so here are the links. Uh, everything's on GitHub. We have an active Google groups with about 400 members, mainly amateur radio operators. And then we also have a main page here, uh, which contains these links and other links that are, are relevant to this project. So thank you. Uh, I, I have this in the, in the rear if anyone wants to take a look at the real unit. Since we're not lighting fast, we can take questions if anyone has any. Is there another revision um, in the works? And what would it include if, if there were? Um, this, is, this is actually revision 2.0. And um, Nothing, nothing planned right away. Right. 
I'm curious if, with all the progress that's been made with the uh, open hardware or open source FPGA uh, tool chains, if you've looked at the Lattice ECP5 as a possible future option for, say, a 3.0 res revision. I, I did look at the ECP5 in the past. Um, the original project that this came from was using Altera, so I kind of went with Altera for that, that reason. Um, I don't know if I have enough motivation to, to change the, the FPGA at this point, but I, I, ECP5 is a good, good candidate, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. Just on a related note, <clears throat> how big is your design? How much of the Cyclone, Cyclone 4 um, are you actually using at this point? So it's about 90% utilized. And what we do is uh, we can turn a knob which uh, has the number of receivers. So we basically turn that knob up to as many receivers as we can. So currently we're at four receivers, so we could like put it in a smaller FPGA and have two receivers, or there's others that use larger FPGAs that have like seven or eight receivers. For the digital modes, you mentioned FT8, and uh, um, so do you support standard uh, decoders for FT8, uh, standard programs like AWJC, X, whatever? And do you support FT9? Um, so, so yeah, what I'm using is a WSJTX, and it was it was written by this uh, retired Nobel laureate from Princeton, and it's it's well maintained, and it connects to uh, software through uh, like a virtual audio channel. Yeah, that that one actually uh, does call WSJTX behind the scenes, kind of like a, a library. All right then, let's thank our speaker.